The rest of you folks, I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, my message is entitled, When God Says No. When God Says No. 2 Samuel chapter 7, please stand up uh, for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to kind of jump around in the chapter here, but I want you to keep your Bible open. 2 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to read verses 1 through 6, drop down to verses 11 through 13, down to verses uh, 16 and 17, verses 41, 42, over to chapter 9, verse 11. You got it? Okay, <laughs> just follow along as I give it to you. Okay, we're going to go verses 1 through 6 first. 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God says no, beginning with verse number 1. And it came to pass when the king, that's King David, sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, the Hittites. <clears throat> David now had conquered them all. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth with curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Now, beloved, as we read 1, Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, we see... Uh, this text more fully explained what he said there. And I'll go along and I'll talk to you about that. Verse 6, Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, that is in the Exodus, even to this day, that has been some 400 and some odd years that have transpired, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. I want you to drop down to verses 11 through 13. And as since the time that I commanded judges, to be over my people Israel, that was about 380 years, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Drop right down to verses 16 and 17. And thine house, David, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. When God says no, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible word of God. And Lord, as I preach on this subject this morning, I pray that you grant us insight, Father. Lord, help us apply it to our own lives, to think back. Some of the times you've said no in our life for our benefit. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. I think that there's not a Christian around that can ever say that they don't love King David, amen? Why? Because we seem, uh, all seem to be able to identify with David, all of his ups and downs and all arounds in life. In fact, beloved, he's the perfect story of poor boy makes good, isn't he? Because he was a poor, lonely shepherd. In fact, beloved David, as that lowly shepherd, the Bible teaches he rose to become king. And he became the sweet psalmist of Israel, beloved. And he's no doubt one of the most spoken and beloved people in all of the Bible, save the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, beloved, he's spoken about more than Noah or Abraham. He's spoken about more than Moses or Joshua or Paul. He's spoken about more than any of the apostles, any of the prophets, save the Lord Jesus Christ himself. No one is spoken about more in the Bible than David. Would you say amen? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you why I believe. Because the scripture says David was a man after God's own heart, and God truly loved him for it. Amen? And by the way, you can be that same type of person. Amen? Be a woman or a man after God's own heart, and God love you for it. Now, beloved, here we learn something from David about the principle of when God says no. When he says no to us in our life, even though we might have the best intentions and we might have the best motives in our heart, but God often says no to his children even when we're not in sin, even when we're not doing anything wrong. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes because we do not understand. Lord, I'm not in sin. I'm not doing anything wrong. Why have you said no to me? And so we don't understand it sometimes, beloved, but God says no. For example, God said no to Moses. Moses said, Lord, I want you to heal my sister Miriam of this leprosy. God said no. 
And then Moses said, Lord, I want you to let me enter into the promised land. And God said to him, what? No, you're not going to do it. God said no, uh, beloved, to both Job and Elijah when they prayed to die in the midst of their afflictions, through all the trouble they were going through. And they said, Lord, take me out of here. I don't want to be here anymore. God says, no way, Jose, you're staying right here. I still got some work left for you to do. God said no to James and John, beloved. They wanted to call down fire from heaven on the unbelieving Samaritans because they did not want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And God said no to Paul, the Apostle Paul, beloved, and when he wanted to evangelize Europe. Yet God says, Paul, I'm not going to do it. And Paul, I don't want you to do it. Paul fell into a deep sleep, and then he saw a man from Macedonia saying, come over here, come over here. So Paul now went into Asia Minor. God says, no, Paul, Europe's not ready for you right yet, but those in Asia Minor are ready for you. God even said no to his son, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed, Lord, Heavenly Father, let this bitter cup of your wrath pass pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. God says, good, Jesus. No, I can't let it do. Can't redeem mankind if you don't die on that cross. Amen? And right here, beloved, we see God says no to King David. David says, Lord, I want to build you a great temple. God says, no, David, you're not going to do it. Hear me now. it's not easy to say no to those that you love, beloved, even though they may not know it's for their own good. See, they don't understand it yet. For example, parents say no to their children to teach them and protect them, and the kids say, why, Mama, why, Daddy? But they they don't understand it yet. And then spouses say no. I I mean, excuse me, spouses say no to each other. (laughs) No, you said it the first way. No, right? (laughs) They say no to each other, beloved, when they may have a disagreement on something, but later on they end up understanding why that no may have been necessary in their life. Amen? Friends say no to friends. They help them out of bad situations and also to look out for their best interests. And sometimes, beloved, when you're looking out for the best interests of your friend and you have to say no, they don't understand how that is in their best interest until later on. Then they see the wisdom of what you said. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, I want us to look this morning about when God says no so we can learn how to say yes when it's His will that is being done in our life. Amen? So the first thing I want you to see here is the desired request. The desired request. Look at verses 1 through 3 again. And it came to pass that when David, that's the king, sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now. I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth with curtains. In other words, what he's saying is God is dwelling in a tent, and there's some curtains behind there, and here he is in his beautiful home. Then he says, and Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Now, beloved, let me give you a little background right here so you can understand what's going on. Excuse me. King David was a warrior king. King David was a man of war, beloved. His predecessor, King Saul, had made him captain over the Israeli army, and when he slew the giant Goliath, all of a sudden he became noted for being one of the greatest warriors in Israel. He led the armies of Israel in and out to battle, even as a young buck. Would you say amen out there? And so he was highly successful in conquering all of the enemies of Israel. And even after David had become king, beloved, God continued to use him to finally conquer and occupy the promised land that he had given to Israel. Now Joshua brought them into the promised land, but a lot of the tribes had not yet driven out all of the Canaanites. But King David put a stop to that. Would you say amen? Now after years of fighting all the bloody battles for the Lord, after years of fighting all the bloody battles for Israel, King David realized something. He finally realized that his throne and his kingdom had now finally and firmly been established by God just as God had promised. Now can you imagine you were a lowly shepherd and God says, I'm going to use you to drive out all of these enemies. And you're just a young guy, you're just a small fellow, but you're a mighty man of valor. Would you say amen? Now all of a sudden it comes to David's realization. You know what? My kingdom is finally and firmly established exactly as the Lord God has promised. And so, beloved, David realized this, and it brought him great joy. 
Now, God had given, uh, given him rest from war, and his kingdom now was at peace and secure, as we read here in the text. Also, beloved, his messianic or majestic palatial home that he built on Mount Zion, it was a beautiful home. It was an aromatic home. It was cut from the logs that were in, uh, cedar logs that were in Lebanon. And if you have anything that's cedar, like a cedar chest, you know how beautiful that is, amen? So now, beloved, here's David. He's building this beautiful home, cedar logs, aromatic, smells wonderful, looks beautiful. And he finally completes that home. Indeed, now as Israel's king, he's living lavishly, beloved. He's living regally. No more blood, no more fighting, no more going out into the battlefield, no more wielding the sword, no more getting cut and bruised and, and sacrificing all of this. Now David's living the good life in regal luxury and opulence. But one day, now that he's at peace, one day during this respite of peace, he, as he thought on all this, he thought about what God had done for him. And as he thought on it, beloved, the more he thought on it, the more he started getting disturbed in his spirit. Why is that, preacher? For this very reason. Because here's David living in this beautiful cedar house, a very palace, and there's God living in a mobile tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant was living in a tent, a little tent that David had erected. David started thinking about it. Wait a minute. I'm only an earthly king. And look how lavishly, how beautifully, how opulently I'm living. But God is living in a tent, the God of heaven and earth. So this greatly disturbed David. You see, beloved, the Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence among his people in Israel. And so, beloved, David had an idea. He says, you know what? This God does not live in a fixed and a palatial home yet, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure that the rest of the time I have during this respite, during this peace in Israel, I am going to build God the most splendorous, majestic home there ever was to honor him so all people can see it. Now, that sounded like a pretty good idea, amen? You see, folks, he wanted all peoples, both foreign and domestic. He wanted all people in Israel and abroad to see the magnificent and majestic permanent home and abode where the great and glorious God of Israel now dwelt on this earth. Why did David do it? Because Israel had a great commission. Israel was supposed to spread the news of the true and living God throughout the world. Now with a great temple like this, beloved, where God's living amongst his people, I want to tell you what, that would stick out like a sore thumb, wouldn't it? You see, David wanted everybody to get to know this God and love this God and worship this God and give him all the praise and glory and honor that he did and that Israel did. Oh, how David loved the Lord, beloved. He was a man after God's own heart. So as David thought of this, one day he decided, what I'm going to do is bounce it off the preacher. Now, sometimes that's not a good idea. <laughs> okay. Only sometimes. No. He thought he'd bounce it off the preacher, and that preacher, of course, was Nathan the prophet. Now, Nathan was a close friend of King David. Nathan was his chief counselor. He was his spiritual advisor. So being a good and godly man, Nathan was deeply impressed with King David's idea. Now, listen to me. Listen to my words. I'm going to choose these carefully. Personally speaking, what did I say? Personally speaking, Nathan thought that there was nothing wrong with David's motivation and desire to do this. Personally speaking, Nathan saw the value of building a permanent home, a house for God, right in the middle of Israel. Personally speaking, Nathan knew centralized worship at the temple would galvanize Israel as a nation, beloved, so he did what we probably would do. He gave David his blessing. In fact, the text, he says, sounds good to me, David. Go for it. God is with you. Go ahead and build that temple. I know he'll approve of it. Unfortunately, beloved, he rashly uh, uh, approved it before he had a chance to pray about it. And it just seemed so right and pious that he had no doubt that God was surely going to accept it. So without first consulting God on the matter, he told David to go ahead and do it. Now, Nathan, listen to me, what I'm saying, beloved. He meant well by doing this. He had no malice in his heart. Nathan the prophet meant well, beloved, but he was not speaking these words from God under divine inspiration like he would have done if he was a prophet. Rather, he was simply voicing his own human opinion, which ultimately proved to be wrong. In other words, that was not God's plan for David at all. 
You see, beloved, you've got to be careful a lot of times. A lot of people say, well, this is what I think God said to me. You're speaking your own words instead of having God speak to you, in you, with you, through you. And so Nathan, who was a godly man, it just sounded so good. He said, you know what? Go ahead and do it. God's with you. I'm sure he'll, he'll approve of this. But you see, beloved, he was wrong. God did not approve of it. And so that night God spoke to Nathan the prophet and he corrected him, beloved, and he, he, he admitted that he was wrong. He went to David and he told David that exactly what God's mind was on this very important matter. But it's easy to see why, as I was thinking about this, and how Nathan the prophet initially approved of King David's plan, but God did it. Now listen to me. God often says no to our plans even when we do not yet know why he said no to us. It may be a good plan. God said no. Listen to me now. Sure, David's motives were good and noble. Sure, uh, David, uh, his heart was in the right place, beloved. He was going in the right de- direction. Sure, David's plan was honorable and righteous. I mean, good night. What in the world is wrong with building a great, glorious temple or a house for your God in Israel? Absolutely nothing, except this was not God's will for David. <clears throat> Boy, that ought to teach us something, amen? How many people have come to me, oh, Pastor Joel, I've had this chance, I've had this, and this, 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 and right away they're counting the dollar signs in their mind, and they're saying their life getting better, whatever. But it is not God's will yet. God has said no, and yet there's things you have to bring to their attention that they're not even aware of, and this is what God ultimately is going to do with Nathan the prophet. So, beloved, there's nothing wrong with him wanting to build a house. So what a, what's the te- takeaway for us, you and I here? Namely this, beloved. There are times when we too want to do something for the Lord, and there are times when we want to fulfill some opportunity or some desire in our life that ostensibly seems very good or it seems right, ostensibly it seems the fitting thing to do, ostensibly, beloved, it seems like the right opportunity or chance It might be that right relationship. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing evil or sinful about our plans and dreams. We may just want a new car. We may want that new home or that opportunity or that chance. We're excited about it. We're even able to afford that new home. We're looking forward to a new challenge, ready and eager to relocate. Oh, that would be nice to move to this new city and have this new home and drive in my new car and have this new opportunity and this new job. Boy, I can just see me right in the good life right now. And God says, no. No. I don't want you to do it. This is not my will for your life. I do not want you to do it. But we say, Lord, I don't understand. What do you mean you don't want me to do it? My whole family and friends, they all think it's a good idea, even an opportunity of a lifetime. But you know what? They're as wrong as Nathan the prophet was. They might have the right intentions, but they're wrong. You see, beloved, listen to me now. A good friend will tell you what you need to hear, not want to hear. It's, you know what my daddy used to say to me, Joel? It is not all gold that glitters. And that's true, isn't it? A lot of people see something glittering in front of them. Ah, that's going to be God's will for my life. God says, no, it's not. But you don't understand, Lord. I can make more money. I can live in a better house. I can drive a better car. I can have a greater job. God says, that is not, that is not my will for your life. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, then we start arguing with God. What's wrong with it, Lord? What's so bad about it? What's the danger of it? But then God says no, and then he starts providentially speaking to us, beloved. He brings us to his word, and one day as we're reading the word, we come across Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which says this. I'm going to go, Lord. You know I'm going to take that new job, that new opportunity. And God says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, he will direct your paths. Amen. <laughs> Lord, I thought I had my hands up. I thought my friends told me this is what I should do. I thought my family said this was the right thing to do. God says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Listen to me, beloved. Listen to me now. Don't you miss this. 
When you do this, when you start trusting God like this, beloved, now you're walking by faith and not by faith sight. Hey, listen to me. Now you're walking by faith and not by feelings. Now you're walking by faith and not by emotions. Now you're walking by faith and not just by some opportunity that has been availed to you. Now you're walking by faith. Come on and say amen out there. Now you're walking by what? Faith. So that's point number one, the desired request. Secondly, beloved, I want you to see the divine response. Look what he says in verses four through six. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, where well, you're reigning and ruling, David, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Beloved, notice what he says. That very night, God spoke to Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet the close confidant, the close friend of David. And he, told to, uh, was he was told to go tell David that he had a much different plan for David's life than what David wanted to do. Sounds like us, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? You see, God also sends us his messages. He sends them to us, beloved. And they speak to us and they tell us that what we're planning to do is not God's plan for our life. How many times have people have talked to me, called me, asked me for counsel, emailed me, did all of this, beloved, and then they said, Pastor, just be up front with me. I said, you want the bottom line to this? I do not believe this is the Lord's will for your life. None of the things that I know, principally speaking, according to the Word of God, are in place for you to do it. None of them. And if God blesses you, it won't be because of, it'll be in spite of. Because God is a good God, and the goodness of God is leading us to repentance. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, why does God do this? God does not do this to hurt us. God does this to help us so we can fulfill His course for our life and that we can reach our fullest potential with the gifts and graces that He's given us and also that He can spare us much pain. You see, beloved, so when God says no, it's for a good reason. So when God says no, beloved, don't you get upset. So when God says, no, beloved, rest assured that he knows more about it than you do, because I told you, my daddy told me, son, it is not all gold that glitters. And, beloved, that has stuck to me like Velcro or gum on my shoe. I've learned just because I've had, I've had many an opportunity since I've been your pastor to be a very rich man, and that's not boasting, beloved. That's telling you the truth. But God said, Joel, this is not my will for your life. I will lie. <laughs> I can still be a preacher. I can still be a Christian. That's not my will. It's not my will, Joel, for my life, for your life. Now, there's five subpoints I want you to see under point number two. The first thing I want you to see is the divine prohibition. Look what he says in verse five. Go and tell my servant, David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Now, beloved, in the parallel passage of 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse four, it explains this text exactly. And there God said a definite no to David's plan like he often does to us. Now, God was not angry with David. I'm sure that the plan and the motives and the desires of David's heart to glorify God and to exalt him, beloved, no doubt must have greatly uh, honored God or flattered God. I really believe God was pleased when he looked at David. Here's David, a man after God's own heart, saying, you know what? I'm living in such a wonderful house, I want my God to have a better one. So I believe that God really loved David for that. What do you think? You see, but Lord, the Lord himself, beloved, the Lord himself had already planned to build himself a house. Now, David didn't know this yet. But God had already planned to build this house anyway, beloved. What God disapproved was, of was when and who he chose to ultimately do it for him. Now, God told Nathan the prophet, he said, go tell King David that it was not yet the time to do this, nor was it going to be him that he was going to pick to do this. God said, I'm going to choose someone else to do it. Namely, it will be your son Solomon. The wuss, excuse me, it would be Solomon. He'd be doing this. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 8, you may want to read that this afternoon. There's another parallel passage to this whole story, beloved. 
It tells us why God forbid David. And this is what God said in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 28. It was because David had shed much blood and had made great wars for the Lord, before the Lord, and all throughout Israel. You see, beloved, the plan and job God had given David in his life was to be his divine instrument, his divine warrior to fight his holy jihads, his holy wars, and defeat all of the enemies of both God and Israel. God says, David, I am raising you up for one specific reason. You are going to be a warrior. Beloved, I can't tell you how I have felt that way as your pastor at TCM. I felt God has used me to use, get the church going, build the church up, but I believe if I died tonight, it will be the next generation that will really prosper. The battles have been so hot. They've been so great. My reputation, everybody, I just found out this week, everybody said I was a cult leader. <laughs> no drinking the juice when we have the Lord's table, okay? <laughs> you know, but I mean, and people are always doing that. So they brand you before they get to know you, know what you really teach or whatever. But I believe once I'm off the scene, unless the Lord comes early, that uh, this church is going to grow exponentially. But all that to say, God's plan for David's life was to use him as a warrior, to commission David, to equip David with the supernatural skills and the strength and the ability, beloved, to be a great fighter and a leader. Why? Because God wanted David to fully conquer the promised land and fully establish the kingdom of Israel, just like he had promised. And then he said, David, I want you to be its greatest king, and through you the Messiah will come, and he will ultimately redeem Israel and the whole world. Would you say amen? David, you will be the model of all the good kings that ever rise up in Israel. And he was, by the way. Just like Joab, Jeroboam, the servant of King Solomon, was the model for all the bad kings that ever rose up uh, in the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. But what am I saying to you, beloved? God's plan was to choose him to do all the hard work, all the dirty work, the bloody job that had to be done before any temple could ever be Erected. Why would you want to be a, build a temple and then have it overrun by all the heathen that are surrounding you? Israel was surrounded by all of her enemies. So why would you want to put a temple up until David kind of tamed the area? Amen? You see, beloved, but after this, after this job was done, the enemies were conquered. God did not want his holy temple to be associated with a man who was known by all folks to be a great warrior, a great conqueror, whose hands and reputation were stained and tarnished with blood and warfare and conflict. What God wanted, beloved, was His holy temple to be built by a man who was a man of peace and prosperity and prestige, which was ultimately done by King David's son and successor, Solomon. God says, now that all of the enemies have been put down, now that all the resources have been stored by your father, now the time you're going to build, it, build this temple, Solomon. So God had a specific plan in David's life. Amen. David had to lay all the necessary groundwork. Somebody has got to do the dirty work. Somebody's got to do the fighting. Someone's got to do the defending. Someone's got to hang in and hang on until things kind of settle down. Would you say amen out there? And so this is what God had chosen David for. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying when God says no, it's for a greater purpose for us, beloved. And now also for a greater job to be done by us and to be done through us for his glory. Amen? So, beloved, that was the divine prohibition. Secondly, I want you to see the divine pilgrim. Look what he says in verses 6 and 7. God says, Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle, and all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? Beloved, here we see again, when God says no to our plans and our hopes and our desires, He usually gives us, or at least makes us sure, we find out the reasons why He forbids us to do something. Amen? You see, folks, He reminds David that ever since Israel's exodus from Egypt, that God says, listen, I have been a divine wanderer. I have been a drifter. I have been a traveling nomad, just like you children of Israel. Haven't I lived with you when you lived in tents? Didn't I live in a tent also? 
well, well, yeah, Lord, you have. He says, did I ever complain about it? Have I ever asked one of you, listen, you're living in tents, but I want to live in a great house. Did I say that to anybody here? Where'd you get that idea, David? See, God never complained, amen? God says, I lived just like you lived. You Israelites went through the desert, I went there with you. You Israelites lived in a tent, I lived there just like you. I can identify with you. Blessed be God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that Christ, I said Christ was the rock that followed them. Would you say amen? Christ was the rock that followed them. And so, beloved, God says, listen to me. I lived in a mobile tent in the wilderness for 40 years, didn't I? Well, well, yes, Lord. And I lived in a mobile tent in Gibeon when, when uh, 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 the judges uh, moved the uh, tabernacle there, didn't I? Well, yes, Lord. Well, I lived in a mobile tent in, in Shechem. Didn't I live that during the time of the judges? Well, yes, Lord. Well, I lived in a mobile tent in Shiloh, in Shiloh for 300 years, starting with Samuel. For the next 300 years, I lived in Shiloh. But you know what? That not only that, I'm living in a mobile tent right now here in Jerusalem. Would you say amen? You see, God was a divine pilgrim. Amen. And you know what, beloved? Sometimes we feel like pilgrims on this earth. The Bible says we're strangers and pilgrims anyways. This whole world is not my home. I'm just, I won't sing to you. It costs you a dollar and a half. You see, beloved, sometimes we think we're wandering aimlessly in our life, but God has an appointed divine destiny for us, like he did for David, like he did for Solomon, like he did for Israel. Would you say amen out there? So that's the divine pilgrim. Thirdly, beloved, I want you to see the divine presence. Look what he says in verse 8. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David. I love that. David was a servant of God. Are you? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, uh, Israel. Oh, beloved, God now reminds King David. David, do you remember when you were nothing but a lonely sheep out there at night, shivering in cold, taking care of the uh, sheep, and it was so bad out there? <laughs> you remember that, David? Oh, yeah, Lord. I remember. Do you remember how I took you from being that lonely little shepherd, and I brought you to be this great sovereign over my people Israel? You remember that, David? Oh, yeah. You see, beloved, God reminds King David and us of how he is always, listen to me now, and ever-present God in our life, and that through His divine providence, He's always there to be near to us, to be close to us. Why, Pastor Joel? I'll tell you why. To lead you in your life. Sometimes you can't get out of your own way. I'll tell you, beloved, He's right there. Why? To guide you, to oversee all the affairs and the activities in your life. In Romans 8, 28, we all love to quote it. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that love God. If you love me, keep my commandments. And them that are called according to his purpose. Would you say amen out there? So why is God so close to us? So we'll sense him. So why God so close to us? So we'll love him and know him. So why is God so close to us? So we'll trust him, beloved, so that when God says no to our plans, We'll know from our past and intimate experience with him and his oversight in our life that he must have a good reason and a much better plan and purpose than we could ever imagine, even though we do not yet understand it. But we must trust him. During the days of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a captivity prophet. The children of Israel were going into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And you know, beloved, God said to Jeremiah, he says, I want you to tell them, this is for my punishment against them because they've been worshiping other gods. They've broken the covenant. But tell them I love them. Tell them I'm going to go with them. And I want you to tell them the big houses down there and and plant vineyards and have children because after 70 years, I'm coming to take them out. And we know one does King Cyrus of Persia. He released them and they were able to build Zerubbabel's temple. But I don't have time to go there right now. But this is what God said to Jeremiah to tell them in Jeremiah 29, 11. God said this. He says, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. 
In other words, God will give you the greatest expected outcome for your life that he knows is best for you. So he says, you can trust me. You can trust that I'm always near to you. You can trust that I know what I'm doing. You can trust that I'm looking out for your best interest. You can trust that I know what's best for you. How many times in my life I've been up against the wall, beloved, as a pastor, and you you have to make some weighty decisions, and they're lonely decisions, and I, I don't say that for myself. Every pastor knows what I'm talking about. And I said, Father, the best of in me is, without any ax to grind, I want to do what's best for the church. But I don't understand this. And God always brings Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 to my, my mind. You say, what does that say, Pastor? God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, says the Lord. Do it, Joel, and let me take care of the rest. Isn't that true? You'll never know the full mind of God. Sure, we have the mind of Christ in us, but we don't have God's infinite mind yet. If we did, we'd be God. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying that God says no sometimes. Now, David had to understand something about this divine presence. For David, this meant that God wanted him to know that he was always present in his life from his youth upward until now. And kids, you need to understand that. Your youth is a folly. Listen to me now. Your youth is going to come and go just like this. And even right now, some of you kids are teenagers, you're saying, I want to get a job. I want some money in my pocket. So you already want to get out of this state, right? You just want to start moving. (laughs) You want to start grooving. My dad told me, he says, Hawk, you don't want to start working this young. I said, why, Dad? Because you'll be working the rest of your life. And he was right. (laughs) Enjoy it while you can because you're going to be working the rest of your life. But God wants you to know, kids, that God is with you from your youth. All the things that happen in your life, God is using them things to train you for his glory. Now, beloved, God was with David doing what? God was right there behind the scenes guiding David and teaching David. God was right there behind the scenes training and grooming David and raising him up to fulfill God's plan for his life from being that lowly shepherd to that great sovereign king in Israel, beloved. Something that David would never have expected. David had said, my family is the least in all of Israel. How can I go from the ghettos all the way up to the top man in Israel? Through God. When God said no to this, and when God said no to that, when God said no to this, but he said yes to this. This is my will for you. This is my plan for you, David. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying the same is likewise true for you. God has been right there behind the scenes, gifting you, gracing you with just the right skills and talents and just the right jobs and opportunities, good, bad, and different, that you're going to need to fulfill that plan and purpose in your life, not only for His glory, so you can be content and satisfied. You know, beloved, money never really drove me, honestly. I wanted to become a millionaire before I was 30, not for the money. I saw, because I, where I grew up from, I grew up from on the other side of the street, and I saw the authority and power money gave you. And that's what I wanted. It wasn't the money so much, beloved, because I'm not a materialistic person. I don't say that boastfully. That's just not me. But I saw that. But that was not God's plan for my life. When I sold my businesses, I had some good money in the kick. But God says, that's it. I said, really, Lord? He said, <laughs> Well, look, I'll be, I'll be able to donate lots of money in my tithe and offering. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're not going to do it, Joel. That's not what I want for your life. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this. When God says no to him and us, both now and throughout his life and our life, that he and we can trust and expect that God was and is always right there doing something specific, a plan, a purpose that's far greater than you in your piddly little mind could ever conceive. Beloved, I never, ever, ever to this day thought I would be a pastor or a preacher. I always thought, I, I used to have a band called the Buccaneers. And uh, if you came to the concert, they said, how much did they get in? We said, a Buccaneer. 
I changed the name of the band to Joe Elastic and his Rubber Band. But no. But anyways, beloved, I thought I was going to be on TV as a musician. I love playing the drums. I, believe it or not, I love singing. I always carry a bucket to carry the notes, but I love singing. And, and you know, beloved, you don't have to have a great voice to sing. You have to have a voice that people like. Some of the greatest voices in the world never make it. Then you get, you get someone like Bob Dylan. The world, they are a-changing. You know, and he makes many of the heart. Right? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. I said, this guy can't care with a wheelbarrow. He can't carry a note. I'll never forget. You folks know Willie Nelson. I remember reading his testimony one time. And Willie Nelson started playing the guitar, and he went to Hollywood, and he went into the producer's office, and he says, okay, I want you to sing and play something. And he started playing, you know, I left all my exes in Texas. And I don't know what he played, okay. And the guy said, get him out of here. Get the hook. He can't sing for anything. And he became a gazillionaire. I read one time the, the biography of Fred Astaire. How many of you remember Fred Astaire? I love Fred Astaire. You know, beloved, if you've ever done the martial arts, you've ever done kung fu, you know the dedication, what it takes to move that body and control everything at once. And to see Fred Astaire going through everything, you know, like, you know, like this here. And so this was the report on him. He went to Hollywood, he went before a producer, and this is what they said. He's losing his hair, can sing a little bit, can dance a little bit. He says, I don't think we can use him. And he became one of the greatest dancers the world has ever seen. In fact, he's one of my heroes beyond him, Gene Kelly. Uh, Gene Krupa, the drummer. Betty Rich, the drummer. Uh, Joe Morello, the drummer. All these old timers were all my uh, heroes at that time. What I'm saying is this, beloved. So when God says no to your hopes, you can trust him. When God says no to your dreams or perhaps your ideas, you can trust him. When God says no, beloved, to you, when your plans, you can trust him because your ever-present God is behind the scenes and he's working in your life and you can trust that he has got something better for you. Just wake up, wake up, I tell you, and see what the Lord is doing in your life. Would you say amen? Oh, fourthly, beloved, I want you to see the divine protection. Look what he says in verse number 9. And I was with thee, David, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all, how many? All thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. I want you to notice how God was also working behind the scenes, protecting David. Protecting David in the bloody battles and walls that he fought, beloved. And not only that, God was behind the scenes exalting his name and his reputation of being a great warrior and a great king and a great ruler, one to be both respected and feared by all people. Can you imagine, beloved, in them days when you fought, you were hand-to-hand -hand combat. You pulled out your sword. You had a long sword. You had a short sword. Imagine the, you're parrying and you're getting sliced here and hit there and knocked down here. And yet he lived to talk about it. Every enemy of his was defeated. In fact, the Bible says he surrounded himself with 600 mighty men known as the Hittites. They were from Philistia. They were Gentiles. But they loved King David. And they were fierce warriors. They were his mighty men. You heard that song, David had his mighty men, mighty men, mighty men. David had his mighty men. Well, that's who the mighty men were. And out of the mighty men, there was the 30, the real 30 elite. Then out of the 30 elite, there was three that were really elite. Okay, so he had these mercenaries that were with him. Not only his own, his own people want to protect him like these heathen that loved David. They had respect for him as a king. They had respect for him as a great warrior. They knew that the hand of God happened to be upon. No matter if God says no to you, beloved, he says yes in other areas. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, so when God, when things go wrong in your life, you know, when God says no to you, you know, he's still there to protect you. He, well, God left me. <laughs> Wake up, will you? Oh, beloved, God's right there. He didn't leave you. You may feel let down, but God has not let you down. And Fifthly, beloved, I want you to see this subpoint, the divine power. Look what he says in verse 10. In verse number 10, he says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. Now notice David's battling like crazy, all the enemies, okay? But God says, David, don't worry about it. I'm going to plant a place for you. <laughs> 
Don't worry about it, Lord. Have you seen what I look like after the battle? I got blood from head to toe. I got guts on my, my sword, my spear. I, I, I won't go any farther with that. This kid's here. Uh, he says, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict him anymore as before time. God alone, God alone has the supernatural power and ability, now listen to me, to either plant or pluck up nations of people for his glory and according to his plan for them, amen? When God said no to David, beloved, about building the temple, he also showed him that God's people both then and now would be safe and secure from their enemies, even though it might seem impossible because his enemies were all around them, just like your enemies are all around you. But you don't understand. You know, look, I know the way things are out in life, and, I, and these people all are against me right now. What have you got a chance? But beloved, are these people, these problems bigger than your God? Are they? See, we, have, we, we bring God down to this little thing. We exalt and magnify these great problems uh, in our life. You see, beloved, God said this, David, your people, I want you to get this now, your people are going to be under my divine protection and power wherever I plant them. And for David, this meant that Israel was now going to have a sure and secure homeland and nation amidst all the enemies of Israel. They were going to be secure. They were going to be the ruling power, the superpower in that area. And they were under David, weren't they? And under King Solomon, they were. What does it mean for us? It means when God says no, his protection, his power, beloved, is still with you wherever he plants for you and you prosper. So I want you to get this, beloved. God, through his divine supernatural power, will still protect you, beloved, even though you may have lost that job even though you may have lost that chance. You say, Pastor, is God still with me? That big break that I had has gone by me. That wasn't God's will. Don't worry about it. He's still there. That wasn't God's will for your life. If you ever stood out and looked, and I said, okay, Lord, let me count. I got this person against me, that person against me, these people against me. I had the TV ministry. We had to make sure, because they were doing everything they could to there was a person that hated me. I don't know who they were, but they knew me. So they would make sure that every time we came up on a Sunday, we couldn't. <laughs> so I prayed boils on this woman, boils, and she got, <laughs> and she died. But, you know, I prayed for my enemies, as God said. Oh, beloved, I want you to see the dynasty revealed. Now we've seen the desire requested, the divine response. You say, is there any end of this message? Somewhere around four. I want you to see the dynasty revealed. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. You know, Often we assume that when God says no to our hopes and dreams and plans, beloved, that now we've blown it. That our chances and opportunities for greater advancement and improvement in my life have passed us by. And I've seen this, people get so down and so depressed and so discouraged, I can't believe it if I only got that job and I only had that opportunity. And your God has died. Why don't we blow taps for him? Why don't we raise the flag at half mass? God is dead and you killed him. Isn't that what we get sometimes? Instead of saying, you know what? <laughs> I was crazy once. There's got to be something much better coming my way. God said no to this and God said no to that. But I know, I know he's going to say yes to this. You hear me, beloved. I want you to see three things that David had to learn here. Because David had these puny little plans in his mind, but God had something greater for him. Note these three quick truths, beloved. God had a greater plan for David. Look in verse 12, verse 11. He said, I'm going to make you a house. In verse 12, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Notice, he's saying you're not going to get assassinated. You're not going to get killed like King Saul. He says, you're going to live to a ripe old age. He says, I will set up thy seed, Someone who comes from your loins after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish thy kingdom. 
You see, beloved, David wanted to build a house for God, but God said no. Why? Because ironically, God says, I want to build you a house. And it isn't going to be a physical structure, David. It's going to be a lasting kingdom. It's going to be a dynasty, the Davidic dynasty. And this dynasty is going to last forever. And it's going to go through you and your children and your son till it reaches your ultimate descendant. Would you say amen out there? You see, God had a better plan to him. God said that Solomon is going to inherit and establish that throne of yours and that kingdom of yours, and he's going to establish it for generations to come. Secondly, beloved, God had a greater purpose. Look at verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God wanted David's son, King Solomon, the peacemaker, to build him this splendorous temple, which we know when I was in school, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. How many of you remember that when we were growing up? We were taught that when we were in school, that that, uh, King Solomon's temple was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. But what I want you to see here, beloved, is it was two reasons under this uh, sub-point that God was going to do this. In the first place, God wanted to exalt the God of Israel so all the nations could now come and worship him. Where do we find the God of Israel? Right there at that temple. He lives right there in the Holy of Holies over the Ark of the Covenant. That was the first reason. Secondly, beloved, to prolong and perpetuate the Davidic throne and kingdom forever, even after the great temple he built had long disappeared from history. And thirdly, beloved, not only a plan or a greater purpose, but a greater promise. Look what he said in verses 16 and 17. He says, in thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Notice, forever. Forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. You see, beloved, God promised David that one of your descendants is coming. And when he comes, he is going to establish an eternal throne and an eternal kingdom that will never end. And this Davidic king, beloved, would redeem both Israel and the world. Ultimately, we know through the scriptures that this ultimate descendant of David was no one less than the Lord Jesus Christ, who was of the seed of David. Amen? Beloved, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 30 through 33, God said this to the Virgin Mary through Gabriel, uh, Gabriel the angel. He said that she would have a son called Jesus who would be great and called the son of the highest. And the Lord God would give to him the throne of his father David and he'd reign over the house of Jacob forever. And to his kingdom there would be no end. Would you say amen out there? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying as with King David when God says no to you it's because he has a greater plan for you. It's because he has a greater purpose for you. It's because he has a greater promise for your life with lasting benefits and bounties, more than you could ever imagine. Oh, don't you hear me now? The Apostle Paul said this to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. He said this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, be glory in the church both now and forever, Amen and amen. Amen. He's able to do more than you could ever imagine. Do you think David, when he's out there at night as a kid, he's wrestling the bear, and the bear comes along and and snatches that little sheep out of his mouth, and then the lion comes along and snatches him. Do you think David was thinking about, I'll be king someday? (laughs) You know what I'd have been thinking about? Run for the hills, the bear's gone. (laughs) How about you? I'd have had the first pair of rollerblades that were ever made. <laughs> so, beloved, let me give you point number four, and I'll close with this. I figure we'll get through by five anyway. The devout prayer. What did David finally have to say about this? I want you to drop down to verse 18. Then went King David in, that is, he went into that tent where the Ark of the Covenant was, and sat before the Lord. And he says, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? I want you to drop right down to verses 27 through 29. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee a house, 
Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessings let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Beloved, you notice King David's reaction and response here to all this when God said no to him wanting to build the temple? You know what he didn't do? He didn't go pout like we often do. He didn't go and, and sulk or complain, oh, gee whiz, I didn't get my way in this, and I've always tried to be faithful to God. And, beloved, he didn't mope around all discouraged and depressed. What did he do? The Bible says he went and he got alone with God, and he sat down before God, and he began to sincerely worship and pray to him that his will that he had revealed through Nathan the prophet would now be done in his life. Would you say amen? And you, beloved, this is exactly what his greatest descendant, Jesus Christ, did in the Garden of Gethsemane, wasn't it? He must have learned from his great, 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 great grandfather. He said, Father, not my will be done, done thy will be done. See, David typified who? The Lord Jesus Christ. He was the greater David. Well, beloved, I want you to talk, I want to talk about this prayer one second. It was a prayer of expectation. Look at verse 18 again. He says, Then when David had sat in before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord? God, what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? In verses 27 to 29, I don't have to read it again. But you know what David's saying in essence, beloved? David knew his humble roots. Who am I? I don't deserve any of this. Lord, I've risen up for a lonely shepherd. I've become a great warrior, a great king. And it's been because of your divine hand, your plan, your supernatural power working in my life that all of these things have come to pass. And I didn't deserve any of them. And neither do we. And yet God still does it in our life, doesn't he? You see, beloved, sometimes you have to remember your humble beginnings. David did, do you? Sometimes we have a nasty tendency. We, we get some education, we make some money, we get on a pedestal and we look down our pharisaical snoots that someone hasn't reached that yet. And that's wrong. Oh, don't you ever forget the rock from which you were hewn. Don't you get too big for your britches. David didn't do it. The Bible says he humbled himself. And you know, beloved, he said, I don't deserve any of this, and neither do we. We don't deserve it, but he's given us family and friends. We don't deserve it, beloved. He's given us education and skills and jobs and homes. He's given us money. We don't deserve it. But bless God, he gave us Jesus. Bless God, he gave us salvation. Bless God, he gave us eternal life. And we don't deserve it. Would you say amen? No. But yes, this is what I want you to do. So it was a prayer of expectation. Secondly, it was a prayer of appreciation. Notice what he says in verse 28. He says, and now, O Lord God, thou art that God. You're the one that promised all this. And that thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. O oh, beloved David had a heartfelt gratitude for God's goodness to him. And when God says no to you, beloved, you still need to pray and thank him for his blessings, benefits, and bounties in your life, beloved, and that plan that he has for you. Amen. Are you a grateful Christian? I, I, I know when I pray in the morning, I hope you do it. After I get through praising God, I'm blessed. I thank Him. Lord, thank you. I got my health. Uh, I'm so, I might die today, but at least I've had my health up until this point. Okay? And I'm able to do things even with my back the way it is. And uh, I, I'm just so thankful that God has given me in my life more than I ever deserved. Now, I don't say that to be falsely humble. I, I, I'll never forget where I came from. Uh, in fact, a lot of my old friends, they say, you know what they always say to me? You're still the same, but you're not the same. And that's good. I was still the same that I love to have fun. I love to cut up. I'm always joking around. But I don't do the things I used to do. Well, not as often. I mean, <laughs> And lastly, beloved, not only was it a prayer of expectation and appreciation, it was a prayer of exaltation. Look what he says in verse 29. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessings, let the house of thy servant be blessed 
forever. David exalted God because he knew it pleased God in his plan to bless and exalt David. So when God says no to you, beloved, exalt him. When God says no to you, praise him and glorify him. Why? Because God loves to bless and exalt his servants who will bless and exalt him. All right, Lord, it wasn't what I wanted, what you wanted, but you know what? Praise you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I thank you for it, O oh God. So even when God says no to your plans and hopes and your dreams, you can praise God. Get along with God. You know, Jesus said this, that God loves to give good gifts unto his children. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God went a little farther than that. Jesus said it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying when God says no to you, offer him up a prayer of expectation. When he says no to you, offer him appreciation. When he says no, offer him up a prayer, ladies and gentlemen, of exaltation. Exalt his name. Lord, you are Lord in my life, not me. And I submit and I surrender to you so I can say yes to what you're doing in my life. When God says no, let's go to the throne of God.